Welcome to Cake the Podcast, the podcast about cake from the State Library of Queensland. This is the show that unravels the sweet and not so sweet stories behind our favourite desserts to understand how we got here. I'm Caitlin Sorry, and to figure out what cakes mean to Queensland, we have to start by looking at one of our biggest icons, the Big Pineapple. It's more than just a 16-metre plastic pineapple on the side of a highway with pineapple-themed keychains and T-shirts. It's also a big part of Queensland's identity. We grow 99% of Australia's pineapples, bringing in $45 million every year. But how did our love affair with piney start? Well, the first pineapples were brought to Brisbane by India via Brazil. Mm, Colonialism by a German missionary in 1838 and planted near where the Treasury Casino now stands. Yes, there was a pineapple field right in the middle of what is now Brisbane City. Eventually, pineapples replaced citrus as the best thing to grow on the Sunshine Coast. And when soldiers came back from World War I, the government had a bright idea. Rather than leaving injured soldiers to hang around the city being a bummer to the war effort, why not give them farmland to grow pineapples? So where there are now rows and rows of houses on the Sunshine Coast, my family remembers there being pineapples as far as the eye can see. By the 50s, there was a golden pineapple week that culminated in the crowning of the Pineapple Queen at a ball held at the Nambour showgrounds. And across the road from those showgrounds lives my 99-year-old grandmother, who was a pineapple queen in her own right. Each episode in this series, we're going to learn a different cake recipe from a master. And today, we're learning my grandma Dean's pineapple pie. Knock, knock. Hello. Hello. How you doing, Dean? I'm coming. See? We're in my grandmother's kitchen. It hasn't really changed much since I was a kid. It's an old Queenslander with bright orange kitchen countertops, knickknacks and fake flowers, and a giant thermometer letting you know you're not imagining it. It really is that hot. Great, thank you. Yeah, we need baby sheets. This kitchen is where I had my first slice of my Grandma Dean's pineapple pie. Now, I know this is a podcast about cake, and pie isn't technically cake, but if you tried its buttery shortbread crust, filled with sweet pineapple and topped with hand-whipped cream, you'd understand why I'm making the exception, and why my family fights over every crumb. Because now that Dean's almost 100, she only makes one pineapple pie a year for Christmas. Like I said, you ever go to the hospital one day and you're really crook, I get to wheel you home, make a pineapple pie, and then I'll take it back up again. Nadine is still going strong, but she lives with my uncle Gary in the same house she raised her five kids in. And every Sunday, my partner Frank and I get to hear some great family stories. Bill was a bit. <laughs> Did you catch that? She's talking about my dad. She just called him a villain. When he was little. <laughs> oh, here we go. Storytelling again. If I was doing something, mm. he'd go run for his life down the bananas. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because Ralph would be down getting the bananas because he'd want to go down too. Yeah. So in the end, I used to tie him up <laughs> to the, uh, the stump. <laughs> So he couldn't go. The horrible <laughs> bloody mother. I didn't know. Didn't have to hit him. I just tied him up. <laughs> you got that on tape, I hope. <laughs> like most ladies of her generation, Dean's recipe is all by feel. She just kind of knows what it should look and taste like. I never measured it. I knew by the feel of it. Yeah. Where did pineapple pie come from? How did you start making pineapple pie? Because we had pineapples, and I used to take the skin off them and cook them. Uncle Gary has gone rifling through the cupboards to see what he can find on the origins of the pineapple pie. Right in the corner it says 1974, so this is the 70s, this book, maybe. (laughs) Older older than that. You reckon older than that? (laughs) When do you remember pineapple pie starting? I'm not arguing with with my brothers. Uncle Gary has found a scrap of paper with some instructions. I've got Mum's recipe written down. Where is it? Ten (laughs) dollars. Per word. (laughs) Is this finally it? So how did you get this recipe? You copied this out of Dean's book. I followed Mum around. That's what Mum gave me all that. I wrote it all down as she was making it. Dean's pineapple pie. So where's your your recipe for the pastry? I don't know. Have a read of that to see if it's in there. Okay. I see you wrote it in hieroglyphics. Yeah, did you like my writing? Mine's very neat compared to Mum's. Reading Gary's Chicken Scratch isn't helping much. 
These days, making the pie crust is a bit hard for Dean. She has a walker she leans on to get around, so she usually buys her crust now. And for the last two Christmases when I've tried to make pineapple pie, I just can't get the base right. I'm determined to nail the base, but it's all in Dean's head. The butter and the sugar, you do that first. Okay. And they've got to be cold? Yeah. Yeah. The butter and the sugar. A pinch of salt. You add the eggs. Yep. Then add the self-raising flour. Huh. So self-raising flour comes last. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's it. You've got some of the secrets of the family. By the end of the episode, I'm going to see if I can reproduce this magic because I want my kiddo to taste the real deal pineapple pie that I grew up with. But before I do that, how did cooking with pineapples become a thing in Queensland? It all comes down to an influencer, someone you may not have heard of, but changed the way we cooked in Queensland. The Golden Circle cookbook was massively popular. A lot of Queenslanders will have that in their third drawdown or they're being handed to them by their mother or grandmother or they remember recipes from that. This is Jacinta Sutton from the collections team at State Library of Queensland and she's flicking through the iconic recipe book. The very first, the Golden Circle Tropical Recipe Book. The colours are so bright. They don't look like real food. No, they don't. That looks almost, you know, plastic. If you don't remember the Golden Circle cookbook, the cover features tropical drinks and a Christmas ham covered in pineapple rings. It's classic 60s photography, pages and pages of almost pop art bright colour photography featuring pineapples. Basically, this came about because there was a glut of pineapples. So the Golden Circle Cannery developed this recipe book using pineapples in every way, shape or form that you can in high contrast (laughs) colour and it was wildly popular. It's so funny they're like we've got too many pineapples Mm. let's make it a thing Mm -hmm. for people to cook with pineapple. Yeah it was spun as oh we live in this climate with this fantastic fruit and this produce let's get into it. But to pull it off the Golden Circle Cannery needed a salesperson someone who could inspire the nation's housewives to cook our way out of the oversupply of pineapples. So they turned to the only Queenslander with that kind of influence. Ruby Borrowdale was also a prolific publisher of cookbooks, a one-woman branding machine, and what we would now kind of look at in modern terms as a highly successful influencer. Ruby Borrowdale was a home economist who used her face and her media clout to sell the latest conveniences to households across the state. There was a common occurrence at the time of women home economists and cooks that seemed to have a marketable appearance and aesthetic that would be sponsored by companies to run test kitchens. Test kitchens were commercial kitchens where home economists would come up with new recipes featuring the company brand. Sometimes it would be a gas company tempting women with modern gas ovens rather than cooking on a fire stove. By about 1932, she was the chief instructress and then the superintendent of the Simpsons Brothers Flour Test Kitchen. And that test kitchen featured, you guessed it, Simpsons Brothers Flour. They would come up with and make recipes that absolutely featured the product. And in Ruby's case, she had a monthly recipe club and Simpsons Brothers Flour was always the first ingredient listed. And it was always listed by its brand name. Got to keep the advertiser happy. You really do. And I think Ruby was quite savvy in the sense that she really understood that. From the 1930s into the 70s, Ruby Borrowdale built herself a media empire. She became a syndicated columnist, had her own radio show, and was the first Queensland cook with her own television show. So as soon as TV really came into the uh, living rooms and the homes of Queenslanders, Ruby was right on that. That's amazing. It it actually is, yes. And at a time when women didn't end up fronting brands that often, Ruby was really selling it. She released these little cookbooks as well. Almost like a bit bigger than a postcard. Is that Ruby on the front? Yes, so that's her face on there. Um, So this is great. This is like an illustrated, it's bright pink and then it's got her face and she looks very like 1940s, red lipstick, thin eyebrows, coiffed hair and then there's a cake mm-hmm. sitting in front of her. She, she's just a floating head on there. I think that's quite funny. It's so it's so 40s. It looks it it's 
like a little bit Jetsons. The State Library has all her old scrapbooks and bits and pieces that Ruby collected over her career. And this paper trail shows that Ruby Borrowdale was so industrious, she had a little secret. She also wrote a column under a pseudonym of Pat Dale or Patricia Dale. I saw in one of the clippings that she had cut out and placed into her scrapbook said Ruby P. Borrowdale and she underlined P and Dale. So the pseudonym came from her own name. She was so popular that both her personas, Pat and Ruby, would often end up on the same page. There would be a advertisement on the same page for Ruby Borrowdale spruiking Spreadwell margarine or Kirabelle margarine or the flower or, you know, the pineapple. So it was interesting that she had these two personas. And all I can really think is that the opportunity to write under the name of Pat Dale gave her the freedom really to discuss either ingredients or trends that she personally liked that wasn't driven by her sponsorships and her deals, you know. So, yeah, very busy lady, very busy. So when the Golden Circle Pineapple Cannery in Northgate, Brisbane, had to offload a bunch of pineapples to the public, Ruby was the obvious choice to get the cooks of Queensland behind the pineapple craze. And that's how the Golden Circle cookbook was born. Wow. This is her copy that was in her papers in the collection, and she signed it there. The Golden Circle cookbook opens with the line, Your meal table is a stage, and these are some of the many parts pineapple can play. And the picture shows a table laden with Christmas ham covered in pineapple, finger foods, fish, and a range of sweets, cakes, jellies, and pies. So is this the influence that led to Dean's pineapple pie? Page 54. It has pineapple pie. Oh, hang on. Place Golden Circle crush pineapple in saucepan when boiling, thicken with corn flour. Yeah. Yeah, that's her trick. And you don't use too much, just a little bit, just to get it to thicken <laughs> so it, like, jellifies. And you have to use crushed pineapples, not the rings. Okay. Not slices, not chunks. No, it has to be right. crushed because that's the right consistency. Ah, okay. And not like fresh pineapple. It has to be the canned. Yeah, it has to be canned. Okay. It's similar, but it's got walnuts in it. Interesting. It's a slightly different thing, but it's definitely close. So perhaps Ruby Borrowdale may have influenced Grandma Dean, but the pineapple craze didn't just touch my family. It turns out Ruby's reach extended far beyond our corner of Queensland. My name is Dale Chapman. I'm a Yalye and Guamu woman from Doombandi in Bolan, and I've resided here on Cubby Gubby Country now since the age of 13. So I've been here a long time, and I'm the owner of My Dilly Bag. We're in Arnie Dale's store, My Dilly Bag, tucked away in Forest Glen. There's native herbs, spices, bush foods, fresh produce everywhere. If it stands still long enough, I'll make something out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and they run all kinds of things here bush food workshops or plant workshops or weaving workshops, whatever people really want, we try to engage, you know, Indigenous people to run those. Arnie Dale is a classically trained chef, but she draws inspiration from country, growing up in Western Queensland. It's quite a big country when you get out there. You could drive for miles and see a few emus and not see a lot of people. And because Arnie Dale's family were often so remote, they had to rely on tinned things. When we were way, way out bush, things that were in cans was our staples because they had longevity, you know. So I remember mum buying, like, small pallets, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. She'd buy 30, 40 kilo of rice and flour and we'd have, you know, 24 cans of jam and, you know, 24 cans of pineapple that she would buy because we'd only go to the shop every maybe two months, three months. So you had to buy like that. Even way out west, the pineapple craze was huge. Because I remember as a kid going to the pineapple factory because it was one of those things you had to do in school. So you always, you know, saw the cannery in action and everything. So, yes, pineapples from Queensland, yeah. (laughs) What do you remember about the cannery? Back in the day, I think it was just that it was quite big. 
you know. And when you're a kid growing up on country and you see the pineapple growing, you don't expect it to go down in trucks and go through the process that it does and then come out in a can. And those canned pineapples led to one of Dale's favourite cake memories. Mum was a great cook and I was 12 years old and mum made me this pineapple upside down cake. It was massive, this big cake. I think it fed us for a couple of weeks, but it was one of the most beautiful things because when she pulled it out, turned it upside down, all these pineapple rings and all the juicy, yummy sweetness just rolled off it. No, I really loved it. Have you made that since? I have made it a couple of times, but I have put a twist on it with the Indigenous flavours. So I've done one with some native mint through the caramel. I've done a wattle seed base cake as well. And I've substituted out, instead of the pineapple, I've done things like lily pillies and quandong which is just a little bit different. But, yeah, just sort of, you know, taking what I had when I was 12 years old. (laughs) And you know what? It evokes lovely memories for you. So, yeah, it was beautiful. But the tendrils of Ruby Borodale's pineapple obsession didn't just stop at the border. The internet sent it international. It started out as the two of us cooking our way through the Golden Circle tropical recipe book and documenting it, and it's just ballooned into this enormous pineapple-based blog. This is Anne Rocker, who with her friend Anne Fisher have been running a Ruby Borodale-inspired pineapple blog for 11 years called The Pineapple Princesses. Our families obviously think we're nuts. The Anne's are both in regional New South Wales, but they have an audience as far away as Russia and the United States with the website bursting with over a 1,000 pineapple-based recipes. And I checked out our blog yesterday and found that we have almost 90 recipes for cake with pineapple in them there. Wow. The carrot cake with a can of crushed pineapple is delicious, as is hummingbird cake and, of course, the many fruit cakes. And the upside-down cakes, of course, that everybody makes. And it all started with the Golden Circle cookbook. I found one in an op shop and Anne was coming to visit. Obviously, we had a whiskey or two at that stage. So, why don't we do something with this? And we did. And, and we were fun. also inspired by the film Julie and Book, Julie and Julia. And yeah. since we're both called Anne, we saw, thought that would be amusing. The Golden Circle cookbook lured them in with its bright photography. It looks like fantastic, you know, all those bright colours. Looks like could be a clown. Some of them look pretty weird. Everything's very well staged, like it's not just plopped on a plate. It's made to look amazing. I mean, the spaghetti with meat sauce tropical on the top of that page, I mean, that's pretty astonishing. (laughs) With the peas. (laughs) Yeah, which which are some of your favourites, like some of the interesting ones that jump out at you? That you're like, I would never have thought to do that with pineapple, but Ruby, she did it. Not cake, but I quite like what the kidney recipes, which sounds terrible, but it actually is quite nice. Yes, I can see Anne wrinkling her nose at that. Yes, pineapple is a great meat tenderizer because it contains the enzyme bromelain. In fact, if you don't cook pineapple, it will dissolve the gelatin in jelly, which is why tinned pineapple is ideal for desserts. It's also why if you handle pineapple too often, like if you work at a cannery, you can dissolve your fingerprints, quite literally. This is documented by science in the 1950s. And they say that the women who work there, largely women in the photographs I've seen, um, have lost their fingerprints through working with the pineapple. Fingerprints is pretty scary, unless you want to be a criminal. Okay, jokes aside, Ruby's approach to seeing the table as a stage fired up something in the pineapple princesses. We just sort of, you know, thought the book was hilarious and we should do something with it and honour the the women who'd come before us. Mm. And pineapple was it. And we admired Ruby Borrowdale too because she was one of the first women chef television presenters too, I've been told. As a home economist herself, Anne Rocker had some advice for me on my quest to replicate my grandmother's pineapple pie. And don't feel so bad if you can't replicate her actual finished product because... Ten cooks can follow the exact same recipe and end up with ten <laughs> different things. Yeah. You kind of make it your own. But they did have some tips on how to make the perfect upside-down pineapple cake. Be familiar with your oven. Don't open the door till you're halfway through the cooking time. Don't get carried away opening and shutting the door constantly. No, because that adds <laughs> to the cooking time. And if, if it's a cake, if it's not properly set when you open the door, it's likely to collapse. Mm. So don't open the door before half the cooking time's passed. 
Yeah. And because once you flip that cake too, you want it to like have the nice gooey drizzle and if it all collapses, it's going to be a muddle of a puddle of pineapple. Absolutely. Maybe keep some extra uh, syrup aside so that you can tip that on afterwards as well. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So I feel like I've learned a lot about cooking with pineapples, but I still don't know much about the woman behind the Golden Circle cookbook craze. Who is this person who may have influenced my childhood? I needed to track down someone who actually knew her. And everything is just smothered in in pineapple rings. It would be great if you were having a 60s party to actually turn out some of this stuff. Um, But yeah, it doesn't look incredibly appetising to me. Not now. This is Jenny, and the story Jenny tells is much less glossy than the ads Ruby Borrowdale fronted. Anyway, I knew her as Pat. She was my dad's first cousin. Pat Dale, Ruby Borrowdale's other pen name. And like her public-facing image, Jenny's childhood memories of Pat are so exotic. She was very tiny, rather eccentric. You know, they'd travelled all around the world. And so I remember their house in Queensland, just full of all these really exotic things they collected from all around the world. I remember Pat gave me a bracelet that was made in Siam. But for all her glamour and intrigue, Jenny's mum wasn't a fan of Pat slash Ruby. I do recall Ruby coming for Christmas lunch and having, you know, quite a few digs at mum over mum's cooking. And I remember mum telling us kids not to mention Margaret Fulton within earshot of Pat. So I think there was some professional jealousy happening there, perhaps. Margaret Fulton was the cookery editor of the Women's Day magazine. And while Ruby Borrowdale, aka Pat, had her television, radio shows, syndicated columns across the state, she was very much a product of Queensland. Margaret Fulton, on the other hand, based in New South Wales, released best-selling cookbooks in her own name, had a national profile, and was even listed as an Australian living treasure by the National Trust. There seemed to be some kind of unspoken feud between Ruby and Margaret. I'm sure it was Mum's way of having a dig and just letting me know that, you know, it wasn't all roses. (laughs) For Pat. And we only know this because Pat slash Ruby would give Jenny's mum such a hard time. What kind of digs would she take at your mum's cooking? Like, how would she oh, express it? Oh, you know, it? Evelyn, that really shouldn't be that colour. And maybe this could have been cooked a bit longer. That kind of stuff. <laughs> the look on mum's face. <laughs> so she's just, like, critiquing the chef in her own home. Yes. I'm sure Mum thought she was a terrible snob. She could certainly give you the look. Imagine what she went through in the workplace. I mean, God, no wonder she developed a rather haughty way. I imagine it must have been bloody hard. God, it was hard enough in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and on we go, let alone what she was dealing with back, you know, whenever she started work. So the lady who led the pineapple craze was complicated, a pioneer, a celebrity chef in her own right, who carved out her own niche at a time when professional opportunities for women weren't in great supply. I feel like her influence had a big influence on my family. So, really? Yeah, my grandmother, who's still with us, she's 99, every Christmas she makes pineapple pie. And oh, wow. Yeah, she won't save your piece. You have to turn up to the house because she makes one pineapple pie and that's it. So I've been perfecting my pineapple pie and so when I – came across Ruby Borrowdale, I was like, oh, this is where the pineapple obsession came from is is Ruby Borrowdale. She was the original pineapple stand. It's so lovely that your family um, is still having that pineapple pie. I'll be telling my mum all about that, you know. (laughs) Okay, so I'm finally going to have a crack at getting this pie right. It's been years in the making. Can I do it? And... Can I get the Grandma Dean tick of approval? Hello. How are you doing, Dean? You make a pineapple pie. I did. I did. In front of you, Mum. This time, my Auntie Jeanette is also visiting. Uncle Gary is being a stirrer, as per usual. No one gets the base properly, only Gary. Kidding himself again. <laughs> oh, this is my adopted sister, Jeanette. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been trying to get this pineapple pie recipe right for the last two years every okay. Christmas. Thanks, I've Gary. been trying to get it right. 
I kept making the bass wrong. I was like, it's not right. It's not the right bass. So we had. Because mum never ever measured, did you? What's that? You never ever measured your things, no, did you? No, I didn't. I never measured it. I just used it to an end. <laughs> and I knew by the feel of it. Yeah. It's my closest attempt yet, but we will see. You guys have to give us the verdict and you have to be honest. I, I, I'm brutally honest. <laughs> All right, you having a piece? Thanks, Frank. Well, no, actually, won't. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five pieces. Having old forks. All right, okay. I'm a professional leader. Oh. Uh, Gary's <laughs> given his opinion already. Oh. There you go, Gary. Holy oh, bloody hell. It's like you've been crust up a bit of bread. Thank you. <laughs> not that I'd win too bad anything like this. Never. Of course not. You would never. Thank you. It's lovely pastry, though. Mm. Thank you. What are the, are the flavours right? I think so. Not, don't think about the thickness, but are the flavours right? The flavour seems to be right. Mm -hmm. I like it. That was good. Oh, thank Weird. you. I've got the Dean tick of approval. I just need to get the base right. I'll have it right by Christmas. <laughs> if you want to have a crack at Dean's famous pineapple pie, Uncle Gary's version of the recipe is on State Library of Queensland's website, as well as some choice recipes from the pineapple princesses. We'll link to it in the show notes. Coming up next episode, we're meeting some of the women who built business empires through cake. I think she had a vision for it and thought, life's short, I'm going to go for it and I'm going to put us on the map. Like any good cake, Cake the Podcast is best when shared. Leave a review and subscribe to show the love. Cake the Podcast is an F&K production made for State Library of Queensland.